this piece of creative nonfiction um, is about coming face to face with that honeyed moment, with, uh, with the ideal. It's called Hundred Yard Hill. Jersey is the real world. Nothing good lasts. It doesn't snow often at the Jersey Shore, and when it does, the sea air salts it by mid-morning and turns it to slush for the car exhaust to spray middle-aged gray before the end of our rush hour. The state is, flat, is a flat plateau, shading inland into slopes no one who has seen real mountains would dignify with the title of foothills. Yet beneath it sits a great mountain, and invis as invisible in this world as Plato's ideal. Only the tip of its highest peak shows above ground, but under the loam, the sandy shale, the red clay, its slopes slide sheer and slippery all the way to the core. Above the ground lies only its apex, the distorted and unrecognized reflection of the cosmic ideal, Hundred Yard Hill. Hundred Yard Hill exists no less at this moment because the moment has slid over the horizon of awareness into the illusion of the past. It exists perfect in the perfection of memory, one of those crystal instants that marks the seams of your life. The hill is covered with six inches of soft powder, melted partly with use during the day and then let refreeze until three o'clock in the morning. I am on it because I am 40, and my youngest son is there because he's 18. This is our last hill together. My son says it could be, but I know it is. So the typewriter is left behind in the quiet work time between midnight and sunrise, when the words burn inside you until they burn away out, are left behind. You can write any time, but only once in your life can you climb Hundred Yard Hill for the last time. The hill is perfection itself. A 45-yard hill, a 10-yard plateau, another 45-yard hill. The length of a Canadian football field, counting the flat, fan-shaped apron at the bottom. And all of it is vertical, coated with ice. No wind, just cold enough to balance the exertion of the climb. And empty. It's a childhood dream, the whole hill to yourself, ride after ride for as long as you can climb. My son takes me up. I used to take him. Only 40 and we have changed roles already. I thought we had decades before that would happen. The hill is hard going up, long and long, longer than a marriage, longer than the ascent into middle age, longer than the time between midnight and sunrise when you run out of words, but just as steep. We climb without ropes or pythons, up the easier footing of the untrampled snow off the shoulder of the ice slope, where the long, stiff grasses of late fall poke through and offer a handhold. My son climbs without handholds. A year or so ago, I would have climbed without them too. Or was it a decade? But it's not all age. I have the oldest pair of boots, the smooth-soled ones with the tread worn off, and even the computer ramp of hundred, the commuter ramp of Hundred Yard Hill is patched slick with ice. My son has my good boots. He inherited them years ago when I sold my motorcycle. He thinks they're his, a legacy granted by the retiring king. I can no longer get them back than Lear. It's an even exchange. I wear his wrestling pullovers with the double thick hoods and the Spartan head on them. The hooded parka is my own and the good gloves, which he has returned to me in deference to my age. The long underwear fits me out like Jeremiah Johnson, the mountain man. I am ready for nuclear winter as I go up the slope like it's the sheerest face of Everest. The hill is slick where the daytime climbers walked it into water and the night turned it back to ice. And I have to go up the last 20 yards like a baby, wondering how many times my knee will come up past my face before all the muscles in my thighs snap completely. It's not just age and ineptitude, the boots won't grab, but then they never do. All the way up, 
I have looked at the ground just ahead of me, the next hand hold and the next. When I was young, Satchel Paige, a baseball pitcher who was pitching when he was 50 years old, said, never look back. Something might be gaining on you. So I don't. And I don't look too far ahead either. The years have taught me all journeys in life are best made one step at a time. You can be sure of achieving that much. Diminishing returns engender diminishing goals. I can't remember when I climbed like my son, looking always at the highest point, not the top of the hill, but the very top of the big tower beyond the fence, the one the Army uses to spot satellites or submarines or the first wisps of smoke from Armageddon. Some passage into adolescence took him up the girders of that towering Eiffel, hundreds of feet above the ground, with no father to catch him if he fell. The MPs came and stopped him partway up, but he climbed high enough to see the rim of the world. I can't even remember what it's like to climb so hard only men with guns can stop you. Head down, I almost bang into the chain link fence that runs across the top of the hill to keep the civilians from climbing to their deaths without authorization. I have to grab the fence to keep from sliding back down. In the last 10 yards, the slope has gone from steep to sheer. We are at that point where only lateral movement is possible, and I go hand over hand along the fence, hooking my fingers into the diamonds of wire, swinging out, hooking again. If my feet go out from under me, I will stick there like a cat too far up the drapes to jump. <laughs> Not until I am all the way out of, in the middle of the ice slope, 11 changes of hands across the fence, do I look down. The hill is a Jersey miracle. Only politics keeps it from sliding down itself. Some landscaper with only enough dirt for half a hill has built a pair of ski jumps, one on top of another instead, trusting that his kickbacks will make him immune to complaints. It seems impossible that we can be standing on top of it. Even clinging to the fence, our legs should be dangling straight down like the slope. The moon shines off its surface, and it looks like water or glass. The depth of the whiteness takes away contour. It seems to drop straight down forever. Clearly, this is the big kid's hill, the one you used to have nightmares about when you were six. The apron, which was so large when we crossed it, looks like a white heel print. I remember it from a black and white newsreel and I wait for the body of an unconscious ski jumper to come sliding across it. All it needs is a strand of snow fence to catch the riderless skis. This is the hill the dead skier on Wide World of Sports goes crashing down. I've never been on this hill before, but I've been on this hill all my life. Still, no matter how many times you tumbled through the agony of defeat, you forget how long a fall it is until you stand there looking down. It is impossible to look down that hill without thinking about mortality. Once you pass 30, 3 a.m. is always 100-yard hill. But it does no good to complain. My son says video gamers 9 and 10 went rocketing down it all day long on sleds instead of the slab of hardened cardboard he has been lugging up the hill for us to ride. They must have been pushing the speed of sound when they hit the first plateau and passing escape velocity at the bottom before they impacted on the snowbank, the plows uncovering the parking lot have thrown up across the apron. My son hooks one hand through the fence and slides the sheet of cardboard into place. He keeps sliding away on the glaze and he has to get a little air under it to control it. When he gets it in place, he stands crucified on the fence holding it to the ice with his feet. He stands on the back of the cardboard and tells me to sit on it and fold up the front like the curve of a bobsled. I look down. The face of my house is not as sheer as this hill. <laughs> the sides of buildings are general rises compared to this. Bobsleds do not belong on ski jumps. Middle-aged men with old bones do not belong on bobsleds. Not even one made of cardboard and imagination. But time and 100-yard hill only run one way, 
and there's no way back along the fence. My son tells me to grab each corner and steer. The cardboard is a thick sheet the size of a refrigerator, and its bottom is waxed. In the spots where the wax is gone, it is glazed with ice. There will be no friction at all. Yet my son intends to push, push, and then stand on the back, crouched like the last bobsledder. With a good push and no friction, the extra pounds of middle age will ca carry us past the legal speed limit before we hit the plateau. Letting go is always an act of faith. I've hung at 3 a.m. on a 100-yard hill of the aging process time and again, and I've been left frozen to the fence, staring down into the interminable whiteness of unworded space more than once. But this time, the going is not my choice. Pushing off into the abyss is easier when you're 18 and undefeated. My son pushes and jumps on. We go with either a scream or a battle cry. Only inside can you really know the difference. Nobody goes, goes over the edge in silence. There's always that irresistible urge to articulate the inexpressible, the rage, fear, joy of hurtling towards the possibility of death. The ride is never what you expect. We go straight maybe 20 yards before the cardboard swings sideways and my son goes flying off. There's no stopping and he dwindles from my reach, sliding towards children of his own. I hear him laughing behind me up the hill. My, my passage half on, half off this magic carpet run amok is a source of constant amusement to him. It's unimaginable to him that he will one day be older than I am now. It was unimaginable to me once. But there's no stopping once you hit the downhill side and I cannot spare enough concentration to look back. Some cat reflex in me, trying to dig in with every available, everything available against gravity and inertia makes me spread out and belly down. I've ridden words at this speed, hurtling into the darkness equally full of gullies and spills and unknown dangers. But it is a long time since my body moved quicker than my mind. The last time I, it did, I, it was 3 a.m. too. I was a cliche then, riding a motorcycle because a midlife crisis doesn't have wheels. And because sometimes the only way you can get your life back into your hands is to put your death in them. It felt the same when my bike went down and I swung my leg from under it and spread eagled on top of it while it went sliding across the macadam. All sliding is done down Plato's mountain. The only difference this time is that the parts that stick out over the cardboard and scrape, around, scrape along the ground only get cold, and nothing is ripped away or ground off, and the earth sliding beneath you doesn't strike sparks from your flesh that sputter in your mind every time it's idle when the clock turns three. But the moving sheet of momentum is the same as I slide and slide through the shining dark toward the possibility of terminal impact. There are ideas that must be made flesh to be truly understood. I never not met one without understanding what Plato meant about the world being a distorted reflection of the ideal. Motorcycles and words and the 70 year drop towards impact are images of the same cosmic reality. Entering the apron, I get a corner up again and slide the cardboard sideways into the soft, soft stacks of snow at the bottom. I sit there looking up at the stars and listening to my son's laughter coming down the hill. I am down, but I am not finished, and I know it. This ride is too much like my last ride to be what I'm here for. Isolated from all other moments, there is a shining crystal instant to be lived here. I do not know what it is, but I will know it when it happens. And exhilaration alone is not its essence. My son comes sliding down the bottom of the slope for the cardboard. When you're 18, one of anything is not enough. 10 climbs, 10 rides is his absolute max minimum. Each climb is like scaling a six-story building, but he is 18, and for him, the climb is nothing. The ride is everything. 
But when you're 40, you've taken too many rides that are not worth the climb. And 10 minutes of exertion is too high a price for 30 ecstatic heart in your throat seconds. He wants to climb and slide all night. He cannot get enough of the drop and rush, the skidding, the sliding, the out of control careening thrill. And so we climb again. At the peak, we stop to rest. Hands hook into, hooked into the fence behind us, we sit on the ice and look out at the rim of the world. At the horizon where the dark sea comes and goes in cycles and waves roll, build, and break, I can see the outline of the senior citizen's tower through the deep purple mistiness. There are a couple dozen streetlights down near the highway. And somewhere off to the south toward the yuppie high rises, a scatter of floodlights from the auto dealership in the mall keep off the things that prowl the world at 3 a.m. The snow makes all the intervening distance seem shorter and lights everything with the glow of the lost ideal that always shimmers in from just outside the frame of a romantic painting. The night is still and quiet. No cars move on the highway. There are no sounds. The air is thin and still and bright, and everything rushes towards the crystal instant. We sit like children, looking out at the rim of the world until the illusion of New Jersey falls aside and the slopes of Plato's mountain slide sheer and slippery all the way to the core. And although it will never be articulated between us, I know my son can see it too. These are a few poems. Um, I write pretty much everything, novels, short stories, plays. And if you're a, young, if you're a beginning writer, I advise you to, do, to try all of those because you'll develop skills in each one, even if, you never, even if you only master one of them, even if you become a poet or you become a playwright, the skills from the others will carry over. Uh, and they will make your work different than the people who started out saying, I'm a playwright. That's what I'm going to be. <clears throat> One of the difficulties about being a poet is that nobody's ever heard of you. <laughs> Even if the most famous current poet, sure, everybody knows Robert Frost, but talk about poets who are, who are reading and writing now. Um, fewer people know them the known the name of the last man picked in the NFL draft. So this is a, a plea from the poet to his audience. Listen, this is a poem. Wait, don't run away. Think of it as a long, skinny short story with great writing and a haunting plot. Wait, for your own good. Listen, if you don't read to the end, you'll never know the antidote. Wait, this poem unfinished will follow you home and possibly infect others. Read on. Besides, this po poem has many rooms, unexpected, unexpected no windowed pleasures, cheap rates due on departure. Here you can be yourself. A poem can be a home away from home. Listen, you think poetry is better because it has amps or a light show behind it or it sells you soap? It's all poetry. You pay for it one way or another. Listen, you gotta warn the others. This thing's alive. This is the real life twilight zone. Stop reading now before it's too. Wait, I was only joking. Honestly, would a poem lie? For what possible reason? To start a war? A cavalier affair? Invite a warlord to tea and assassination? How could a poem change anything? Listen, don't be afraid. Wait, don't run away. Listen, this is a poem. This poem is, as far as I know, the first poem published by a faculty member at Brookdale. From 1960, it was written in 1969. 
And I know you've probably all read about the 60s, but they're different than they are in the books. People were not stoned all of the time. <laughs> all right, most of the time, but that wasn't the only thing that was going on. The world was changing. The 50s were almost like Puritan times. There was a guy, there was actually several guys, and I, in guys, they weren't, there weren't women that were involved, who sat on a board that looked at every scene in a movie to make sure that nothing that would upset anybody could be shown. Married couples had to be in separate beds, twin beds, and you could have a kiss while sitting on the bed, but somebody's one foot always had to remain on the ground. And then came the 60s and the children of the 60s, and they weren't like anything before them. They didn't care about the rules. They'd been grown up, they had grown up being told that this is going on your permanent record. Like someday you'd win the lottery and they would be just about to hand it to you and someone would go, wait a minute, we looked at the permanent record, you cut class three times. <laughs> you can't have the money. And all of a sudden there was a generation that said, I don't care. I'm going to do what it feels right to do. I'm going to do what it feels good to do. And that was a new thing. Because the generation before my generation had been brought up to do the right thing, the expected thing. It's not a real bad philosophy. It's just that it had gotten encrusted over the years. And it needs something to break it, break it apart, something new. And that's what the 60s were, basically. <clears throat> well, was, that was when Brookdale was started, 1969. It, it was revolutionary. This was the best community college in the country. It was at the cutting edge of education. Things were being, and the great thing about it was that even the suits let you alone for a while. Yeah, they, true, they, they screwed us on our salary every chance they got. But in the classroom, you could do anything you wanted to. And you could do it because nobody knew what the hell education was anymore. It used to be you got these facts, you make people learn these facts, you test them to see if they know these facts, and that's all there was to it. Making people think, giving people an opportunity to grow and find out who they are, and it was unheard of at the time. And Brookdale was one of the places that started that. Now, in a, <clears throat> it wasn't all the summer of love, by any means. There was a lot of violence. Um, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of, I mean, revolutions don't come easy. People, young people at least, really expected a revolution, an actual, just like the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Some were hoping for the French Revolution where we would take the rich out and cut their heads off. Other ones were, were, were hoping for an American Revolution, like the American Revolution, where there was just a tyrannical government and people standing up against it. Whenever there is a revolution, there several things happen. Uh, one is char charismatic leaders emerge almost always from among the young. And the other thing is that people fall in love. And the last thing is that they get swept up in the flow of events. History picks them up and takes them along with it. I wrote this poem when I was sitting on my front porch during a late uh, summer thunderstorm. And what I was looking at was all mixed up in my head with, well, lots of stuff was mixed up in my head, but it was mixed up in my head with that whole idea of revolution and the flow of history and ordinary people who nobody thought was going to be famous all of a sudden becoming leaders. <clears throat> it's called revolution. Big surprise there. <laughs> Rain leaps in the street like white flames. 
Drops burst from the macadam crevices like silver mortars. A leaf goes by, running the street water. Only one, with his autumn death already brown upon him. One leaf riding the street water, this one time swept along by events. One small leaf, still wondering why, when the wind whispered, he leaped. One insignificant leap, leaf, whirled along in a revolution of water, tearing itself on the macadam where the water almost runs out, almost, almost, almost stopped. Time upon time, turning on one point after another, tip and stem and needlepoint into the main current. One revolutionary leaf, moving mindlessly unaware of his movement in the inevitable current. One other leaf, a ground, immune to the water's rush, wearing her shroud of orange like a veil, wondering why, when the wind whispered, she leapt. Until some wind, why does it always happen just this way? Ripples to center flow an inch, and they collide. Hung on the honeyed moment, they enjoy the battle of go and stay, until they twist without breaking into the sweep of water to rush, to rush, to rush, headlong under the parked machine. And the water bubbles moon domes like lives beginning and loves flowering and both bursting. And the needles of rain leap out of the water in protest and fall back invisible. While brown and gray and gray black, the water pours out of the driveway and into the street, into the street and under the car, <clears throat> leafless until one magnificent leaf, gold in his autumn death, wearing his orange like a cloak of kings, one giant palm-wide leaf, one majestic leaf, moves in the rich brown center current as if the water moves by him. The rain quickens like a drumbeat, and a white shadow of wind blows across. Why does it always happen just this way? Unt until behind him, the matted leaves, pressed and dead, quicken as the swollen stream reaches out like history to touch them. And they too spin and wheel and free themselves of rises where the last rain left them to rush together like a nation of madmen, headlong after the majestic leaf down the rich brown cur center current of time, headlong, headlong, headlong into death. Why does it always happen just this way? There's a great variety in poetry, different kinds of poems, and each of them has its own purpose. For a long time, the main uh, focus of poetry was on narrative. It was on telling a story in verse. Uh, as a science fiction writer, I wrote a lot of science fiction poems. And this is, a, this is a, one of those narrative poems that tells a story. Uh, a teacher of exobiology is uh, exobiologists study alien life. So these are college students who go off to other worlds. It's in the future in which we have space travel, and um, they're always pioneers who go out and, and plant, you know, like, uh, oh, I can't think of their names, typical. Um, <laughs> the two guys that wandered around in the West and named everything. And they were Lewis and, Lewis and Lewis and Clark, who couldn't have gotten anywhere if they didn't have Sacagawea, because she knew the route. She knew how to go. And besides, she asked directions. <laughs> Lewis and Clark would still be out there wandering around if they hadn't had a woman with them to tell them where to go. <clears throat> this is called How I Became a Teacher of Exobiology. We called her 3C, like her dad, who said that she was three cats wise. Everybody thought she had nine lives, while all the rest of us had less than one. She liked rough men, and I was never much for tough and tumble, even back at school. So what I saw in her, she never saw in me. Still, when she went afield, like exo-bio majors are supposed to do, I followed her to some blue jungle world two light years out. The expedition took a liking to her. Everybody did. 
But out of all of them, she liked an expedition brat, born there the same year we were born on Earth, who served as expedition guide. He was tumble rough, all right, and full of frontier jokes a 12-year-old would laugh at here. But she thought he was fun. She called him Pikeling. Anything but Pike from us would put him in our face until we got it right. But she was three cats cute and had so many lives. You want to go upland when we go ne next, he asked her. There's poison rocks out there, I said. They laughed, and Pikeling said, the bad ones have a reddish spot on top. No danger there unless you're blind or careless. 3C said, an exobio studies alien life, raising a finger like our exoprof on Earth, and made me laugh. Ah, uh, she was three cats curious, and I was less than one. So out we went, where rocks bite and blue jungle trees can wrap you sleeping in a hug of death like we were on a picnic in an earthside park. A boy man raised by burly men Pike treated her like they were boys together. Two days out, the way a boy would, devil his best friend with a fright, he tossed 3C a redless rock. She barely caught it when it opened up, all teeth and grisliness inside, and bit her on the thigh on the way down. And when it closed again, we saw the spot, bright red as new spilt blood. She went quick, with surprise still on her face, a smothered laugh stuck halfway out her mouth. Who would have thought so many lives could go at once and leave us none? Maybe the rock was on its back or on its side, the way they never lie, according to our exoprof, who'd never been off Earth. But she was dead the same for all of that. And Pikeling, looking at her, bloaty blue already, where the venom made her veins distend to capillary depth, picked up another red spot rock and pressed it to his heart and died. But not as quick as three cats wise. Almost rock bit with disbelief, I cried. It was an accident. He tried an explanation, but there was no time. We play by different rules out here, he said. I tell my students that when they come in. I tell them when they go afield, you young who think you're three cats wise, you young who think you have nine lives, blue jungle worlds will leave you less than none. One of the things about being a poet is that any experience can, be a, can become the seed of a poem, no matter how mundane and trivial it is. Um, it's that Plato's instant, that shining instant, and it can come at any time. Uh, one of the ways I used to look at the world was as if it were totally different from what science says it is. Not a series of laws and rules that automatically follow one another where the ends of things can be predicted, but one where there were forces, both benevolent and malevolent, working in working against each other in every life, in every action, in every object, in every event. This poem is about that, about that mystical world that maybe exists side by side and interpenetrating with the world we see every day. It's called The Old Dog Finds His Spot. We had a lasso apso. Uh, it's a little dog, but and it's called a lion dog. It's called a lion dog because it thinks it's a lion. This, this dog never backed down from no, another dog, no matter how big it was. Um, and I got to have the feeling that he was heroic somehow in a way that I didn't understand. I'm waiting for the dog to find his spot. Every three hours, all night long, you must go in search of it. Malign powers move it every time. Old, almost blind, near death, near death, he can't be rushed. If he goes in the wrong place, it will unbalance the earth, and we will spin out of orbit into the sun. He must choose carefully. 
The grass this time is out of bounds. Evil is sequestered there. Up and down the macadam, down and up, back and forth, three times three, he searches for the center of all things, known only when he finds it. Precision is everything in this right. Right time, right place, right direction to or from the wind. All driveway looks the same to my blind eyes, the foolish apprentice assisting here. He teaches me nothing of the design he alone can see. What dread malignant powers wait unseen in the, un, in the mundane world. He walks the ritual that reduces them to ordinary driveway, ordinary walk, to flagstone and macadam, earth and sky. And when the demonic shrinks back out of this world, he places at hell's door his sign to ward them off and staggers to the bottom of the steps, unsure how many more times his strength will hold to carry out his duty to the world of seen and seemingly familiar things. Malign forces nullified by his design, his ritual walk done conjuring up the divine, the rite concluded, he waits at the bottom of the step to be carried in by the stupid apprentice, unaware of the cosmic dangers everywhere he steps. <laughs> Sometimes when you write a poem, because like all writing, at least part of it is about ideas. But if you just deal with them idea, as ideas, it doesn't near, it work nearly as well. So you need to personify them in one, in some way. And just like a fiction writer does, you give them, a, you build up a character. Um, this is called First Encounter. Death had a shirt like, the dipl like a diplomat's funeral and a chest of gray hair. Youth, no space and a need to get through. So youth said, listen, friend. And death said, yes. And youth said, don't push your luck. You know you're old. And death said, true, but I don't get any older. And one eye said entropy and the other said wheeze. One eye said heart attack and the other said stroke. Death had dark glasses and a dangle of cigarette. Youth, no time and the will to go by. He said, I'm stronger, said death for a little while. One eye said cancer and the other said paunch. One eye said the wind goes first. The other said the legs. So you said move it. And death gave a nod and one eye smiled somewhere and the other smiled soon. One eye said, for the moment, and the other said, in a while. So youth went by like charisma and the throb of sensation, and death stood aside like the patience to wait. One thing about uh, being a poet is you're never gonna get rich, and you can have enemies. Critics are the automatic enemies of all, all writers. Editors are sort of semi-neutral because they do fight your case and if they like your work, they're great allies to have. But there are other ed editors there. So when a book goes in um, a long time ago, like when Hemingway wrote, you wrote a book, you sent it in, an editor, a first reader read it, passed it on to the editor, the editor read it and if he liked it, the book was bought. But somehow that changed. And it became that when a book came in, a first reader read it and passed it on to an editor. And an editor took it to the editorial board. And the editorial board was made up of uh, salesmen and publicists and people who got the books taken from one place to another. And their question was always, yeah, it's great literature, but can we sell it? So there's always that idea that uh, when you're a poet, you're not going to make any money anyway, that uh, nevertheless, you're still always being, you still have all these adversaries that you never get to go and present your case before. This is called The Boxer. Beat bloody, 
What is it keeps the poet staggering back to scratch, round after bare knuckle round? Kidney punched by the critic, eye thumbed, nose bit open, kicked in the clinches, need, the editor in his jailbird shirt, flicking the flap of skin as if he'd stopped the massacre if only bone were visible. The poet's wife and children waving their rags and crying, for the love of God, lay down, lay down. While the big promoters and the poetry mob in their university boxes, covered with kisses by faculty wives and the fell professors cry, lie down, lie down in the fourth as we decreed. You cannot be a champion here. One of those things about there not being one reality. There can't be one reality, because we all view it from a different perspective. Looking from over there, you see something entirely different than if you're over here. It's called only four of us in bed. At first, there are only four of us in bed. My you and your you. Your me and mine. We are like rabbits hidden in the trees of a child's puzzle. Half of us are obvious, half are invisible. The four of us would make a great couple, if there were not six of us. <laughs> you as you used to be keeps turning off the light, and me as I used to be sulks. But even they don't come alone. There's my you as you used to be, with whom I don't get along, and there is your me as I used to be, who I hate outright, and the same on your side. It's like a family reunion where nobody is talking to anybody else. My you as you used to be hates you as you are now like sisters-in-law who are fat and thin. Your me as I used to be is always looking for a fight, and my me as I used to be always makes sure he gets it. If you did not bring in both of us as we will be to act as doddering peacemakers, there would be bloodshed every time. I tell you the truth, sometimes I wish we could slip away just the two of us. <laughs> the only problem is, I don't know who I'd take, you or you or mine. And what's more, I'm not sure which me they'd go with. <laughs> These are the last two. Um, one of the things that a great many poets have is a, a tie with their past, a connection with their ancestry. Even though they're, they've never met, obviously, most of their ancestors, yet where they came from and what those people were like and what they passed on. Because you, your genes didn't just come from your parents. Their genes came from their parents and so on back as long as human beings have been, been reproducing. This is called All My Ancestors Breathe With Me. I like to watch my breath go up the sky, winter nights when the sky is royal blue, like a ghost late for heaven and climbing fast. I think my Nor Norse ancestors stood the same, the snow crunching under their shuffling feet on the late watch, breathing puffs of spirit upward. And the Welsh magician kings, whose drops in the sea of my blood transformed it into poetry, watched the smoke of their incantations rise the night and the Dutch guildsmen trampling home on packed snow, who live also in my blood and do the organizing, saw the smoke of their trade unionist rants go up the sky. And the Germans, the old Teutonic knights, sitting in cold armor on horses breathing smoke, surely cocked a visor nights like this and billowed breath to God. And the Celts, blue painted with, like the frozen dead, naked to the waist in the night woods, waiting dawn in the attack, followed their mouth ghosts up with awestruck eyes. And the English men, cold, angry Protestants looking for a witch to burn, the, to burn the night, cold black as God's wrath to the faint of heart, watched their souls swirl upward in the empty night. I like to watch my, breath, my breath go backward up the rope of my jeans. Each strand, some night standing man, always looking upward, wondering where in the winter sky the ghosts of his breath were going. As I said earlier, the, and this is the last one. 
Um, as I said earlier, there are different types of poetry for different things. Now, the sonnet, you've all, probably all heard of sonnets, and you probably even know the rules to them. They have to have 14 lines. They have to rhyme in a certain way. They have to have the same beat. Soft, hard, soft, hard, soft, hard. Five heavy beats per line. They're supposed to make a comment on human nature. And they were also used for seduction. So this is, a, this is actually a love poem, although it won't seem like one at first. <laughs> all men lie, all women do as well. Some lie for public office or for gain. Some to cover other lies and some to sell. And some to save themselves or others pain. All have their reasons, either good or bad, Though some it's true, lie just because they can. Some lie for sport, and some because they're mad. Some lie to get a woman or a man. Some lie because they see it as a gift, a natural talent meant to be expressed. Some lie because they love to cause a rift, where love or friendship make their lives seem less. Some lie so much they just don't know what's true. All humans lie, my love, except for you. It's important, I think, to write as much as you can at the same time and go through the same rituals. Um, my older son wrote an article once, and he was a football coach, and he wrote an article, and he was also a track coach, and he wrote about the ritual, how every, especially in track, the shot putter doesn't just pick up the, the shot and walk out. Instead, he's got a certain number of things he has to do to loosen his neck, and he hefts the weight to several different times, and then he puts it in, and it doesn't fit, and he takes it out and puts it back in again. And after about three or four minutes, he throws the shot. Um, and what he's doing, of course, is getting his body to tell his brain, we are now in shot put throwing mode. <coughs> And that's what you need to do, I think. I think it helps to do it anyway. You don't necessarily need to do it. Some people can sit down and write any time. Um, but if you set up a ritual like that, and you go through, and a lot of writers have it, it's not just poets, um, it will help you, to help you so that when you sit down and you're looking at that blank piece of paper, and nothing is as blank as that blank piece of paper especially if you've already gotten money for what you're supposed to put on it. Because <laughs> when you sell a novel, at least you used to be able to sell uh, three chapters and an outline. And then they gave you some money and gave you a date when you had to have the other 90,000 words done. And it's the first time you sit down with 90,000 words ahead of you to write, it's tough to find one. Um, Jeff Ford, who spoke here last year and who's a famous uh, fantasy writer, or uh, it's not fantastic. What's that realism that they now call? Magical realism. He's a really a, a magical realist. And when he was here, he and I talked writing all the time. And we had a technique where we agreed that we would sit down at the computer, and whatever the first line was, we would write it down, and we would write a story from that. And we wrote a lot of stories. I mean, he, we wrote separately, but he, uh, we wrote a fair amount of stories, and most of them were accepted somewhere. So it's a, it's a, it's a good technique, and the focus of it is really to get you not to worry. If you're sitting there going, are they going to like this? Is it going to work? It gets harder and harder. Whereas if you've said to yourself to begin with, I don't care where this goes. Maybe tonight isn't a night I'm working on the money stuff. Maybe tonight's just a night when I'm just going to let things flow out. And uh, the, maybe the greatest thing about being a writer isn't as you would think, and I'm only doing this on speculation, um, it isn't getting rich and it isn't getting famous. It's those moments when it's like you're taking dictation. The words just pour out of your fingers. And it's not even your voice in your head that's giving them to you. And you don't know where things are going next, but it's a great ride. 
and sometimes you get to chapter 15 and your protagonist is in a jam and there is the very thing that he needs to get out of it and you put it in on the second page. And you go, damn, I'm good. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if anybody gives you money for it or they like it or it ever gets published or anybody else reads it. Because that feeling in itself is what it's all about as a writer. Because actually you have the tools for a revolution. They don't control social media yet. That means you can talk to anybody anywhere and say anything you want. And at the moment, at least, they can't stop you. I mean, it's a scary, it's a tool. And like any tool, it can be used as a weapon. So but the 60s weren't a happy, and necessarily just a happy time either. There were some real dangers. And there's some real dangers in that, but I think, uh, I know even sometimes I get caught up in the myth that this generation, uh, because you'll sit and text to one another face to face, um, that, that you're disengaged from each other, and I've, I've come to realize that's not that's not the, the truth at all. That, that social media actually bind people together. That even things like Facebook and even people, even old people, go on that <laughs> and read about their grandchildren and their and their grand nephews and things. And in a way, families separated by distance are brought closer together. So I think this really, this generation is actually going to be um, more loving and more idealistic and maybe make the changes that the s children of the 60s couldn't make. I don't know, we were talking about this earlier um, when we were at dinner. And I think if I were young, I would start out self-publishing because for two reasons. One is the decision on your work by a publisher is again made by a committee. And it's made on the basis not on how, how good it is, but on how likely they believe they are to sell it. So what happens to a lot of writers is um, they send out their works and their works get rejected. And they think, well, my stuff must be no good. And it eats away at their confidence. And then they, start, they send out things less and less and less and less. Um, whereas if you self-publish, uh, Excuse me a minute. If, if you self-publish, you don't have to care. You still got to, writing has changed. Even way back, people like Dickens were not only great writers, they were great self-promoters. My generation, self-promotion was frowned on. The easiest way to get yourself ostracized by other writers was to promote yourself all the time. But the writers who did that, the writers whose lives got talked about, got gossiped about for that matter, um, they were the ones who tended to last. Like Poe. If Poe hadn't been a junkie, maybe we wouldn't even be reading him. The fact that he was, and well, not just him, Lord Byron, all those romantics, they were all smoking opium <laughs> and writing about it. And because it wasn't real commonplace, people were going, oh, what wonderful visions you have of the, of the supernatural world. And they were going, yeah, here, have the pipe. <laughs> um, an agent will help you if you can get one. But he's looking at it with the same eye that the editors and the book committee are going to be looking at it with. Is this something that can sell? There's a lot of good agents. And they will fight your case. And if you want to go the standard traditional publishing route, you're going to need an agent. It's very difficult to send something in over the transom now because it's so easy to put a manuscript together and submit it online. You can do that. I mean, it used to be you had to type up a 200-page novel, and you'd have to type up the whole thing five times and to send them out to five different publishers. Now, you can sit down, and in maybe two or three hours, you can send your novel out to, to five publishing houses. And you don't have to go and do the research writers used to have to do to see, does this 
publishing company do science fiction. You can't just send it out blind. You had to do a lot of research. Now you can go on uh, writersdigest.com. There's about a, at least a dozen, dozen other sites that will tell you what the publishers want and even sometimes what kind of novels. Like they used to just say that they publish romance. Now there's different genres in that. Uh, erotic romance is a whole separate thing. It's not quite porn, but it's got a foot in one camp and a foot in the romantic camp. So if you want to go the traditional route, I'd say try and get an agent, but don't stop writing while you are, and don't stop self-publishing. And that was the other thing about social media. Now when you go with a book, they ask you how many followers do you have. If you've published it yourself, they want to know how many copies you have, you've sold. And if it's, even if it's like 5,000 copies, that shows them somebody's going to buy this book, and they're much more likely to take it. And they also know you have followers, so you can market to them directly. That's another reason for self-publishing is when you go to the traditional publisher, you get 10 to 15 percent of the royalty of the, of the money that the publishing company gave. Now, it's true. They put money into it to get it printed. They hire salesmen and stuff, and they risk, they risk their capital. So they do deserve a, de a decent size of it. But if you self-publish, you get to keep it all. If you do it on Amazon, you get to keep it all, but I think 15%. So in other words, you don't have to have a bestseller to be able to make a living as a writer, although I don't think there's really more than maybe a thousand writers in the country that live just on their writing. You know what the rest of them do. They teach. <laughs> Playwriting is a good, it's good practice for screenwriting. And playwriting, <laughs> the reason why I said to try to work in a lot of different genres is um, playwriting will help you develop your dialogue. You won't have to read. If you, if you put a lot of exposition in there, a lot of explanation, you read it, unless it's a real hardcore reader, they're going to get bored quickly. But if you can put that information in the words of the characters, it works a lot better. So I, I, playwrights, playwriting's a good place to start. Um, it is one place, though, where you have to pretty much make your contacts yourself Get into the, get into theater, whether it's local theater or whether you go to New York, and and do it there. I guess we're done. Thank you very much.